Before there was Daniel Bryan, before there was Steve Austin, there was only one man of the people in the wrestling world. He was the son of a plumber who understood just what it was like to walk in the audience's shoes, and because of this, he won their love in droves, using this to rocket himself to the top of the wrestling world and create a career that saw him become a legend. And if that wasn't enough, once all that was over, he had a second career behind the scenes, taking his many talents and passing them on to create a lineage that still exists to this day in the form of his many, many students, not to mention his two sons, who have gone on to make huge waves in the industry in their own way. So join us today as we take a deep dive into his entire career journey in American Dream, The Dusty Road Story. Virgil Riley Runnels was born in Austin, Texas on October 12, 1945 into a working class family, where he was, of course, famously the son of a plumber. This working class background would give Virgil an appreciation of the plight of the common man and woman, something which would remain part of him even as he became a major star in the years that followed. While growing up, he would also find a keen interest in athletics, and despite not having the typical physique expected of someone in the field, he would end up playing football for a while, at one point even getting briefly signed to the Hartford Charter Oaks in the Continental Football League. That said though, by 1967, the youngster had realized that football wasn't going to be a long-term option for him. And so, after seeing an advertisement for a wrestling school run by Boston promoter Tony Santos, he decided he would give that a go. Having been a fan as a child and already being friends with the legendary Funk Brothers at the time. So with that in mind then, he got in a car and headed up north where, despite having no prior experience in the industry, he would bluff his way into classes after name dropping the Funks and using them as references to get a foot in the door. From there, he trained for a few months before he was ready to hit the ring for the first time, initially adopting the ring name Dusty Runnels as he paid his dues by working matches for low paychecks while living in his car and visiting soup kitchens to get some food. Yes, these were tough times for Virgil, but they helped to instill in him a further appreciation for what he did have, that being a quickly burgeoning career as, only a year after this, success would begin to befall him when he moved back down to Texas, joining Fritz Von Erich's legendary world-class championship wrestling as he altered his ring name to Dusty Rhodes. There, he became fast friends with Gary Hart someone who would subsequently become the future legend's manager as he established himself as one of the territory's top heels over the next year, taking out babyfaces everywhere he went while drawing the hatred of audiences. After his time there peaked, however, Dusty would move around once again, a common practice during the territory days, as by 1968 he had joined the Kansas City Territory, teaming with Dick Murdoch to form the Texas Outlaws. And this team wouldn't be limited to just Kansas as it happened, because together, they would tour as far and wide as the American Wrestling Association up in Minnesota, championship wrestling from Florida and the Sunshine State, and even international promotions like Australia's World Championship Wrestling and Japan's International Wrestling Enterprise. Primarily though, Rhodes would stick to NWA-run territories during this time, as they were the real kingmakers in the industry. And so, if you wanted to climb the ladder, you had to be in good with them. And it didn't take long after this before NWA officials started to realize that they had a major star on their hands as by 1974, Dusty had turned babyface. Yes, despite his unconventional look, fans had started taking to him in droves, his natural charisma and magnetic interview style causing people to flock to any shows he was at. Yes, by then, Dusty had started forming the character that would make him a superstar, the American Dream, a working-class hero who had worked the same streets and suffered the same struggles as those in the audience, leaving them feeling like he was fighting for them at all times. So popular was he becoming that in 1977, Vince McMahon Sr. even began bringing him into his New York territory, the World Wide Wrestling Federation, the precursor to modern-day WWE this sparking a working relationship that would continue for the next decade and would prove that Dusty could get over with a notoriously tough East Coast audience just as well as anywhere else. During that period, in fact, he even main-evented Madison Square Garden on two separate occasions, each time challenging superstar Billy Graham for the WWWF heavyweight title. And, well, he never managed to take home that prize. By August 21st, 1979, at a live event in Tampa, Florida, the Dream was able to topple the mighty Harley race to win what was arguably the most prestigious title in the industry at the time, the NWA World's Heavyweight Title. 
this solidifying him as one of the top workers in the country as, while well, he would lose the belt only a week later, he was from then on in a made man and used this reputation to continue drawing packed houses everywhere he went. Unable to ignore this for much longer then, by 1981, the industry's governing body had no choice but to give him a second run with the gold after he beat Race again for the honor, this being a somewhat longer run that saw him tour promotions across the country as the sport's top representative, drawing an even bigger audience towards him. But by this point, it wasn't just his professional life that was thriving, because his personal life had reached new heights too when he married his partner Michelle Rubio around the same time this being the dream's second marriage and the one that would later give him his youngest son Cody, who would in some ways go on to change the industry even more so. Of course, that wasn't Dusty's only male heir though, and by the early 80s, his oldest son Dustin was already thinking about following in his father's footsteps by getting into the industry. And as it happened, this ended up being easy for him, as right around then, the American Dream had become the booker for Jim Crockett Promotions, the territory he would make his home base for the majority of the remainder of his in-ring career. And while with Jim Crockett, Rhodes was able to reach an even greater audience still, becoming a nationwide television star as he started teaming with Magnum TA to form America's team, the ying to the villainous Four Horsemen's Yang. This, of course, was also the start of the now legendary feud between Dusty and Ric Flair, a feud that would go on to define the promotion in the late 80s as the common man and the high roller became the perfect foils for one another and had a series of battles to settle who was the best. But it wasn't just Flair that the Texas boy was having to deal with during those years. He also had some memorable programs with foes like Abdul of the Butcher, Black Jack Mulligan, Terry Funk, and even his old foe Harley Race, putting on some great matches with each of them as he proved that even if he was writing the show behind the scenes, he was still doing more than enough to earn his spot at the top of the card. At this time, he also had a memorable run with the Road Warriors, at one point becoming the world's six-man tag team champions with them, but perhaps his finest achievement during these years came in 1983, when he developed Starcade, a super show spectacle unlike anything anyone in wrestling had done before him, beating WrestleMania to the punch by a full two years. Yes, while Vince McMahon likes to claim that it was him who dragged wrestling out of the bingo halls, it's really Dusty who deserves the credit for coming up with the idea of a major closed-circuit television broadcast first, and the show would go on to become a staple of Thanksgiving and later Christmas for years to come. But despite all his hard work to build the promotion behind the camera, what fans were more concerned with at the time was Rhodes' long-running feud with the Horsemen, and more specifically, Flair, who would become his primary foe during what remained of the decade. And this was a feud that reached its next phase during the lead-up to Starcade 1984, the same event that The Dream had created the year prior, as the Nature Boy was set to defend his NWA world title against the son of a plumber, eventually beating him on a technicality after Dusty was bust open at the forehead during the match and deemed by the referee to have lost too much blood to continue. This, however, only served to make fans want to see their hero take down the champ even more. And so, throughout 1985, things got heated up further when the horseman attacked Rhodes in a parking lot, kayfabe injuring him for a while and setting the eventual final showdown for Starcade 85. And it was during the build to this match that Dusty would cut his now iconic Hard Times promo, probably the most memorable babyface promo in the history of wrestling. In it, he told the audience watching at home that just as he had gone through hard times in the months prior, he understood their struggles all too well too, the struggles of the textile workers and auto workers all around the country to put food on their table and remain in a job that had been made obsolete by a computer. With this in mind then, he stretched out his hand to the screen and asked them all to reach out and touch him, vowing that he would win the title for them come the night of the match. This, of course, was a masterclass of promo work and its reputation has certainly been earned over the years. What most people don't remember now, though, is that the match it was hyping up ended up as a bit of a damp squib when Rhodes beat the Nature Boy to win the gold, only for this title reign to later be rescinded when the victory was deemed a disqualification one after the fact. This was a prime example of the Dusty Finish, an infamous match ending that the Texas native became well known for doing during his time as a booker, one which saw the babyface get the big win to send the crowd home happy, only for it to be reversed later on so they could continue on with the chase story going forward. 
It's not a bad idea in itself, of course, it's just that at this point, Dusty used it so much that it eventually reached the point of parody, leading some to turn against his booking of the promotion overall. He was smart enough, however, not to execute this finish on July 26, 1986's Great American Bash, when he and Flair had one final rematch to determine who the real champion truly was. And on that night, in front of a rapturous North Carolina crowd, The Dream finally beat Slick Rick to win the NWA title for a third time, this beginning his last run with the belt. Part of the reason for this was because at this point, his duties as a booker were taking up so much of his time that he didn't have the time to hold the title too anymore, especially given that he was in the middle of a war with Vince McMahon and his reimagining of the industry as a colorful, cartoon-like spectacle. And in comparison to McMahon's new version of wrestling, Dusty's old-school ways began to look passé to so many by the end of 1988, he was fired from his role as booker with him from there making brief returns to both championship wrestling from Florida and the AWA before figuring out that if he couldn't beat them then he would be best served to join them as the American Dream signed with WWE. Yes, in mid-1989, The Common Man became the New York promotion's newest on-screen character, though those who knew him from his days in the NWA were surprised to find a different interpretation of his gimmick being portrayed now. Taking the Man of the People character quite literally, in fact, Dusty was introduced in a bunch of vignettes that showed him doing a number of blue-collar jobs, such as being a pizza delivery man, gas station attendant, and of course, a plumber, all before he debuted in a now infamous yellow polka-dotted singlet, which many at the time felt was specifically designed by the notoriously petty McMahon to humiliate his former competition. It was also around this time that Dusty was paired up with Sapphire, a middle-aged lady who would represent the common women watching at home that would act as a manager to Dusty. And as a pair, the two would quickly get over with fans as they entered into a feud with Randy Savage and Sensational Sherry in the lead-up to WrestleMania 6. And on the night of the eventual mixed tag match between the two teams, the first match of its kind in WWE, Dusty and Sapphire even got the big win. Though, soon after that, she would end up turning on him when she joined up with the Million Dollar Man Ted DiBiase, this leading to the WWE introduction of the oldest road son Dustin, as both he and his father went to war with DiBiase and his manservant Virgil, the latter being a character who was introduced into WWE years prior, specifically as a rib on the Texas native. It all came to a head on the January 19, 1991 Royal Rumble, when the father-son duo finally got their hands on their rivals in the ring, ultimately losing that match, however, as they were not long for the company, with both handing in their notice shortly thereafter. And this would also mark the end of Dusty's career as a full-time in-ring wrestler, with him from there focusing more on his backstage duties as he jumped back to WCW, the company that Jim Crockett Promotions had by then morphed into later that year. There, the dream once again became a booker, though this time he would be part of an overall committee, something which led to many backstage disagreements at the time when it came to them trying to decide on the direction of the promotion. Of course, he did still make on-screen appearances, briefly becoming a manager to Ron Simmons as he went on to win the WCW World Heavyweight title in 1992, and then later joining the announce team as he did commentary alongside Tony Schiavone and Bobby Heenan. He also became a part of the industry-changing NWO storyline in 1996 when he turned on his old friend Larry Zabisco and joined the villainous stable, from there serving as a manager for the Outsiders, something which didn't go down too well with fans of his who remembered him for being the ultimate babyface. That in mind then, this character change would eventually be walked back on when he returned to the side of the good guys a couple of years later, effectively retconning the whole incident as he resumed his duties as a man of the common people. After that, he was kayfabe fired by the company's vice president, Eric Bischoff, and largely kept off TV until 2000, at which point he left the company for real, having a cup of coffee in Paul Heyman's Extreme Championship Wrestling, where he put over the former champion Steve Carino, all before ultimately returning to WCW just as they were preparing to close their doors for good. Once that happened, Dusty at first neglected to sign with WWE again, instead hitting the ring once more as he went out touring the indie circuit as well as working on his own turnbuckle championship wrestling promotion, where when he wasn't training young students, he was taking on a number of old foes such as Terry Funk and Kevin Sullivan. 
At this time, he also used his legendary status to help upstart promotions like Ring of Honor and TNA gain a foothold as he had a number of one-off appearances for the former, and then spent three years working for the latter as both a part-time wrestler and full-time booker. Hell, while with TNA, he even got one more shot at the NWA World's title when he had a generational match against AJ Styles for the gold in 2003, losing in the end but putting over the younger talent strong in the process. By May 2005, though, the party was over with TNA, as Rhodes had resigned following a number of behind-the-scenes disagreements with management. From there, he would make a couple more independent dates, most notably having one more I Quit match against Terry Funk on December 3rd of that year for Carolina Championship Wrestling. But by this point, his days in the ring were coming to an end, and so, after opening up discussions with Vince McMahon once again, Dusty decided to end his time in the biggest company possible as he re-signed with WWE, initially working there under a Legends deal that would see him serve as an ambassador for the promotion while also providing consultancy to the creative team. And after establishing himself in this role, he would even make a few more appearances in the ring becoming part of Team Legends at the 2006 Survivor Series, and then having a Texas Bull Rope match with Randy Orton a year later, this officially marking his final televised in-ring appearance at the age of 61. And in 2007, the American Dream also became a WWE Hall of Famer when he was inducted by his sons, this finally being a last great missing piece of his lengthy and successful career a career which, with the exception of one more in-ring performance at a Florida Championship Wrestling Live event in 2010, would now be done once and for all. But despite his days in the ring being done, it could be argued that Dusty's most important years were still ahead of him, because from 2010 onwards, he would become the head writer and creative director of NXT, WWE's developmental show. And while there, he would not only help to turn the black and gold brand into the company's most critically acclaimed and creatively successful one, but would also help foster a whole new generation of talent, imparting his decades worth of wisdom on pretty much everyone who passed through NXT's doors over the next five years, including the likes of Roman Reigns, Charlotte Flair, Bray Wyatt, Kevin Owens, Sasha Banks, and countless others. So influential was he on this generation of talent that many of those performers have since confirmed that they wouldn't have made it as far as they did without him. But it wasn't just them he was helping improve, because in 2013, he also got to work a program with his children, Dustin and Cody, building one of the greatest feel-good family stories in recent years as the Rhodes boys worked together to bring down the shield at that year's October 6th Battleground pay-per-view. Sadly though, just two years later, Dusty would suffer kidney failure and the complications that arose from this would end up being what took him as he passed away on June 10th, 2015 at the age of 69. And this was certainly a shocking death, one which no one in the wrestling industry was prepared for. Over the days that followed then, and as the news began to sink in, tributes were rained down on the dream, with many telling stories of all the ways he had helped them not just in their careers, but their personal lives too. Of course, Dusty's death would hit his sons harder than anyone, and this would later contribute towards Cody's decision to leave WWE, betting on himself and his father's belief in him being a star, and from there, eventually becoming part of the group that would form AEW just a few years later. And with this company now firmly established as the number two in wrestling, the son of a plumber's legacy continues on in both promotions, with him still being remembered in NXT through the likes of the annual Dusty Tag Team Classic, while also regularly being referenced in AEW through the legacy he left behind in his children. In fact, AEW have even gone as far as to name the spot where the show's producers sit behind the curtain as it's going on the Dusty position. That said though, for as much as younger performers will always be thankful for the way he gave back to the industry in his later years, it will ultimately be his in-ring career that he'll most be remembered for, because when it comes down to it, few people have ever been able to command as much adoration from fans as he did. He may not have had the traditional look of a champion, but he always made this work to his advantage, using it to connect with all the fans out there who looked more like him than they did Ric Flair adding to this with some of the greatest babyface promos the industry has ever seen. The star of pro wrestling, Vince McMahon, perhaps put it best when he remarked that no wrestler ever personified the essence of charisma quite like Dusty Rhodes. Yes, you could make a solid argument that he was the best of them all, in fact, and you'd certainly find a lot of his peers who would agree with this statement. Whether as a wrestler, booker, trainer, or pioneer of the super show, Dusty did it all 
and throughout it, he never lost touch with the common man, this being a prime example of what will forever make him the personification of the American dream. Well guys, what did you think of the video? Let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, as well as follow Wrestle with Andy on Instagram and Twitter. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.